Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hello everyone and welcome to Bouncing Back, the personal resilience science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I am your host, Joanna. Let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Bouncing Back, our personal resilience podcast. I am your host, Joanna, and today we are going to be chatting about life purpose, a massive topic, but we're going to hone in on the idea of thriving through life's purposeful challenges to better our resilience. And joining me today to help me do that is our guest, Dr. Lakshmi Ramachandran. Dr. Lakshmi is a scientist turned coach and speaker, and also the recipient of Singapore's 40 over 40 honor, helping people, especially those in STEM, stay on track, achieve milestones and reach the destination that they want. Hi, Lakshmi. So great to have you here with us today. Really excited to be here today on a Friday morning. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us. There's no better place to be than here on a Friday morning. Absolutely. Great. Now, before we get started, I'd love if you could tell us a bit more about your journey into STEM. I know that you've had quite the journey to get to where you are today. So I'd love if you could tell us a bit more about that. Absolutely. Of course, I started my journey through STEM quite a while ago, um, back in my teens, actually. So somewhere around the age of 15, I developed this passion to do science, to become a researcher. And so that is something which I kept on pursuing, which led to my PhD in cell and molecular biology back in 2006 from the US. So I worked in a cancer institute and did most of my research there. And from then on, uh, my specific goal was to become a cancer drug discovery researcher. And I worked in a big pharma company in drug discovery, which was a very, very meaningful and very rewarding time in my life. But then of course, you know, life happens. I got out of the STEM track for a while, uh, and I will share more of that in our conversation today. But looking back, it was again another enriching experience in my personal life, which actually shaped my journey today from, from you know, researching or being a scientist to more of an explorer of life through a human and spiritual lens. Amazing. Yeah. So yeah, today that's my role as a coach. Um, I also write quite a lot. I love philosophy. So yeah, happy to share more of that in today's conversation. Great. Well, I'm sure we'll get into it as well. But before we do that, we have a section called Have You Met Dr. Lakshmi? So here we just get to know you with some fun little questions. So my first one for you is what is your favorite book? My favorite book is The Alchemist. Oh, yeah. I love that book. Yeah. I think Paolo Coelho has done such a fabulous job. It's a book that I would like to, you know, keep going back to all the time. Some of the quotes still remain with me and um, it connects with me so much about this. So there's so much about all of these things, you know, human nature, resilience, optimism, hope, and then going back to, you know, that self. So I, I love that book. Oh, a hundred percent. I recently just pulled it out of my bookshelf and I'm going to reread it again. Um, but it's, it's such a great book, especially yeah. for today's topic. We're talking about life's purpose. And that book is genuinely about finding your life's purpose. Um, and yeah, highly recommend that book to everyone as well. So I'm so glad you brought that up. My pleasure. <laughs> great. Um, our next question is what movie have you enjoyed recently? So movie, honestly, I'm not a very big fan, actually. So uh, I don't, uh, I mean, I I watch movie for simple leisure. So I'm from Kerala and India. So I do tend to watch some Indian movies that come 
yeah come out and when my friends call it's mostly like for the purpose of entertainment you know yeah yeah so and then netflix is is there so once in a while it's just on the weekends you know watching netflix or going for a malayalam movie or something like that yeah, yeah. definitely great um and those are bollywood movies that you enjoy Bollywood movies, you know, I like those kind of movies wherein you it's it's like you can just totally relax. It's a lot of dance and you know those kind yeah. of things wherein you don't have to think too much because the most of the other times I'm thinking a lot. But I also watch a lot of Malayalam movies, which is from my native uh, Malayalam is its language uh, of Kerala, which is the southernmost state in India. So they those movies are really very you know rich in stories, very meaningful movies actually. they do not have much of the entertainment quotient as compared to bollywood movies but they are good for a really nice you know yeah like it makes you think makes you yeah that those kind of movies actually yeah yeah great i've never heard of them before so that's really interesting mm, yeah so india because it's got so many regional um languages and movies as well so the yeah the it's beyond bollywood actually when you look into indian movie scenario Great. Yeah. Well, I'll have to look into that a bit more. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so my next one is are you listening to any podcasts at the moment? So podcast, the one podcast that I listen to is Work Life by Adam Grant. So Adam Grant, yeah, I I I like that uh, podcast quite a bit for the quality of um you know, talks that come out actually. I've listened to a couple of your podcasts as well. This is which is very good, you know. Amazing. Yeah. So mostly, uh, w- once in a while, when I walk to office, um, that's the time I listen into podcasts. Yeah. Yeah, I find that listening to podcasts is, is such a great thing to do when you're like on the train or you're trying to go somewhere. It's like the perfect yes. time. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of knowledge, right? You get a lot of knowledge within a very short time. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And there's so many different podcasts that exist out there and you yes. can get information about anything that you would like to, which is great. Which is great. Yeah, totally. Totally agree. Yeah. Um and I've got one last one here for you which is do you have a role model? So, um I was, you know, like really thinking about this recently because you know, the International Women's Day is coming up and this is the time, you know, when so many role models are speaking up and it's a great time to showcase role models to um and girls as well right girls in yeah. science and girls in stem and of course any other area but when i look at myself i think i've had um role models who were in that you know celebrity category or big um like top top notch achievers back yeah. when i was in my teens so i even had i think back uh, when i was around 15 or 16 around the time that i developed an interest in science I did I did have some role models you know in uh, in science as well but at the same time I also had role models women who actually um you know really really shown on stages such as Mrs Universe and you know sorry Miss Universe and Miss World pageants um and Indian Indian girls who won those pageants during that time so I think it was a time when I was like really influenced by them uh just seeing their sheer courage and um, boldness to be on stages and actually conquer global stages that inspired me quite a bit but of late as i'm getting you know as i'm getting older i have also begun to appreciate real life role models in my own life like yeah. my mother and my husband's mother who inspire me through their sheer their love their giving their patience i mean really mothers i think yeah i draw a lot of inspiration from them these days Yeah, definitely. And I feel like when we do talk about role models, we often think they're just celebrities or famous people, but often it's like the people in our lives, like our parents, our mothers, that yeah. are our biggest role model as well. Yes, absolutely. And they're relatable, you know, they're relatable. So yeah. when I see like for example my mom, my mom, she is currently studying um she's been studying Sanskrit during the pandemic. uh she found yeah sanskrit uh, sanskrit is an uh, indian language like ancient indian language and uh it's an amazing it's a very beautiful language and not very easy i mean at least i feel it's not very easy to learn but yeah. when you yeah but my mom i don't know she found this passion to learn it and she's been really really doing a great job and i started teaching it so when i look at her i just feel oh my god it's so possible to have a purposeful life at any age and stage of your life Yeah, 
Yeah. Definitely. And like your mum probably knows you really well and might know you the best. And it's very relatable when someone you know and someone who knows you is your role model as well because you can talk to them, you can get advice from them yeah. Um, yeah. and guidance, which is great. Yeah. And they they become your biggest cheerleaders, you know. So even my husband's yeah. mother, yeah, biggest cheerleader. They're like all for me to pursue my dreams and achieve my goals. And they constantly remind me, you know, take care of yourself. You're doing enough for your children. You know, they will be, they, they will grow up and they'll be fine. But from their own experience, they say, take care of yourself. Yeah. So I think this is just such, such an amazing support system to have, actually. Yeah. Definitely. That's really interesting because my mom always says that to me. She's like, always make sure you take care of yourself and you put yourself first. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it actually makes a lot of sense and it is the truth. And I can yeah. share more of it in our conversation from the point of view of being a mother. And, and you know, the kind of sometimes the guilt we carry, right, as uh, mothers and how, yeah, how reframing of that is guilt in the sense, no matter how much you do for your children, you know, there's this feeling that, it's not enough. It's not enough. So yeah. my mothers and even my husband, you know, they remind me, you know, you're doing enough. Just take care of yourself. Yeah, That's a constant. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And we can get def like more into that for sure during yes. our conversation. So let's get into all of that. Um, my first question for you is, why do you think resilience is important in our lives? See, resilience, I think it has always been important, right? Since the beginning of humanity, I can definitely look back and see that so many, so many um, events have happened in the world so far, right, including the recent pandemic. And yeah. what has really helped us move forward is what? I mean, it's a collect it's our collective resilience as humans, right? And so, but, it, but especially in today's world, right, when I look at today's world, which is currently being described as the Bani world, B-A-N-I. Oh. So initially, like, I think just pre-pandemic, it was called VUCA. VUCA was like a uh, acronym that was really there to describe the world then that is volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous that was VUCA but today the world is being described as Bani B-A-N-I which is brittle anxious N for non-linear and I for um, yeah I mean I'll, I'll yeah get that get to that uh, you know very soon but it's being described as a world where which is like very unpredictable like you can no longer predict this you know world um, anymore it has become it is it's that illusion the it's like it's not no longer so perfect it can break or crumble anytime so that's the brittle uh, thing right and it's yeah. leading to a lot of ang anxiety in this world so and and so because of that, I think uh, especially it is important to have this quality of resilience, which is really being able to manage such a dynamic and disruptive world. I think that is a that is a most important thing. You know, today we we need to have the ability to bounce back in uh, such a world when because so many people are losing jobs these days. Nothing is very certain as it used to be before. So that is something to really look into. Yeah, definitely. And I find that's very true, that the world is increasingly more yeah. brittle and people are more anxious. And because of the ever-changing nature of things and like the world, like we do yeah. fear yeah. that a lot. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I'd love to talk a bit more about your career. So can you share like the pivotal moments that led to your transition from a career in cell and molecular biology to coaching and speaking? Yes, absolutely. So, um, like, as I said, when I, I was, uh, you know, at the age of 15, I had at most clarity in what I wanted to do in my life. And that clarity came from, I think, from a very young age. Uh, of course, I wanted to achieve something in my life. And the clarity also came from what I didn't want to do. For example, what I didn't want to do was um, like my parents wanted me to get into the medical profession. So back then, career options were not uh, so much as it is today, right? It, the mainstream careers were to like doctors, engineers and those kind of categories. So uh, my parents wanted me to become a medical doctor because I was quite good at biology. But I knew very well that that was not a profession I wanted to be in. So I kept looking for... Um, 
for you know professions wherein i can be i can study science but yeah. not be a doctor like medical doctor so that is when i kept looking and i came across subjects like biochemistry and molecular biology and uh, i was able to find specific colleges that offered those courses back in india and and yeah so it it's something like this like how in the book it says right an alchemist like when you really want something all the universe conspires you know to help yeah. you get it so similarly from one stage to the other doors were opening up for me uh, i did my masters in india but it was a crowd that was very focused on uh, you know like doing a phd in the us so by just by being in that crowd of uh, extremely like very brilliant people i was also driven to pursue my phd in the us and that too with a scholarship so in 2001 i flew to the us at at a time and you know at a time you uh, when there were no cell phones right there were no cell phones and credit card was not like it not everyone had a credit card like today so the lack of a cell phone and uh, i mean today when i look back i don't know how much trust we used to have in ourselves and how much trust parents had in us you know to just let us travel that yeah. far so yeah i think that was really probably my first ever bold step out of the comfort zone to do my phd i was only 21 so i went there and um, i was a student managed my life quite well as a student uh, learned a lot it was a grounding experience actually for me wherein it was really about fending for oneself while doing the course right so i managed to finish my phd that too with a dean's award for outstanding dissertation in cancer genetics so i got my phd at the age of 26 so till then my whole approach towards life was you know you, if you have a dream you have a plan you have a goal things just work as you plan this was my thing i was like so 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 super confident about it right yeah. i mean all these things that we talk about today productivity i think unknowingly i did it back then <laughs> right yeah. i mean yeah but then that is when i think life came in to teach me a big lesson so so i was really flying high i got into the drug discovery job that i wanted in a big pharma company uh, but that was also the time when i faced a very big personal challenge so the personal challenge was with the uh, infertility which is i something which i really took for granted that starting family would be the easiest thing in the world to do and because i was like i already did my phd which is like the you know should be the toughest thing in the world and yeah. but contrary to my expectations yeah having starting a family became the biggest challenge for us yeah and my husband was also he is his profession is in the merchant marine when he where he travels quite a bit so though that was a time when we were also not together so i went through a lot of like emotional um you know what to say i was really down during that time alone uh, battling with all of these things and it was a very 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 difficult phase for me and then finally i made a choice of um stepping aside of my career outside of my career to really focus and give some time to my personal life why did i do that i did that because i knew that career can i can always rebuild my career but yeah. i had this realization that our biology you know though technology has advanced our biology has not changed we are still the same you know <laughs> so i wanted to give more chance to my pursuit of a motherhood at the right time so yeah so that led to a big career break um and a lot of questions i went through a lot of like um, i think you know anxiety and irritable bowel syndrome all you know that affected my mental well being quite a bit during that time but at the same time with the support of my family like my mo- the mothers that i mentioned you know my husband's mom they all stepped in to support me and gave me a lot of hope so i kind of that was i think my first experience or twist with resilience like i bounced back i bounced back um, and you know i i conceived our first child and during that time i also conceived a book which is a yeah which is a, a cookbook it's a cookbook in the sense it's a memoir cookbook based on mine and my co-author's life as graduate students in the us yeah yeah so that was i think that experience that led me to understand something more about us as humans that is you know we are beyond what we think who we are like our capabilities i never thought i could publish a book 
until this happened. So one by one, of course, there was a lot of changes in my career. Relocation to Singapore. Uh, for the first time, uh, my husband and I could start living together um, under the same roof. Our, we had our child, first child, then the second child. And um, yeah, life was good. But then it also meant a lot of career transitions for me because I couldn't get back to research. And all of those career transitions um, that I did, you know, kind of, I would say starting due to challenges, okay, then changes in my life as a mother, relocation, and then lastly, by choice. Finally, through all of this, I was able to connect the dots and understand that, understand or recognize a passion or a purpose to serve people through coaching and speaking. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I would say it's not, it was never easy. I had to look back a lot, connect the dots and arrive at where I am today. Yeah. Amazing. And that sounds like quite the journey, but you use resilience and your own productivity to get through it. And in what ways do you think a sense of purpose serves as a powerful anchor during times of, you know, difficulty or adversity? Yes, absolutely. So purpose, I think, is a um, very deep-rooted, deep-rooted, um, you know, thing in our lives, right? So I hear many people often saying that, oh, you know, you're so lucky, you have a passion, you have a purpose. I haven't found my purpose yet. I think it is because people attach like that or think of purpose as something like really big, you know, bigger, than, larger than life kind of a thing, purpose, right? Yeah. So I think uh, purpose is not really... Um, we, we don't have to like give it such a big definition. Purpose is really the reason why you want to wake up in the morning and live your life, right? I mean, that is how I would uh, define purpose as, like I said, how my mom found a new purpose in her life that is to learn and teach Sanskrit even more. Yeah. And and just by, you know, and I, I also feel that when, you know, purpose also is something wherein, in my experience, right, if I say, that uh, I was initially, I wanted to become a scientist, right? But if I look at it, if I redefine it as from I wanted to become a scientist to I want to impact lives positively, like by coming up with new medicines, you know, to treat diseases, that becomes a purpose. So yeah. today it is like, oh yeah, I want to, you know, really be a great coach, a great speaker. From that, if I redefine and say, I want to impact lives positively again um, by helping people recognize more of themselves and all that. So I feel that when you define purpose this way uh, and connect to it, everyone will be able to identify what's their purpose in, in, in the, what's the purpose in their life. And this is important uh, in, in resilience because it is your why. Your purpose is really your why, why you want to, you know, get up and get up and get going every day. So yeah, in, in, um, in um, difficult times, during difficult times, it's the why that will actually help you get up and get going again like you cannot like for example uh, even today you know when difficult situations come come up as humans we actually do feel I mean I'm not saying that you know we don't feel no matter how um, you know how resilient or how much you have demonstrated resilience in your past uh, right you will still feel stress and things like that as you move along but it's really about knowing it knowing what uh, how it is impacting you and then connecting back to your why, that will allow you to move forward. Hope yeah. I'm making sense there. Yeah. No, that definitely does because yeah. I feel like when you are in, you know, times of difficulty or adversity and you're unsure of where to go or you feel stuck, it's that sense of why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I want to do this? That will help you find more meaning. And I guess that also relates to life's purpose because life's purpose is, what do I want to do with this chance I've been given to be here on this earth? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you said it. Yeah. Even yesterday I was reflecting on the same thought, right? That we are all here for, for something, right? I mean, I was sharing this with my son as well. Um, we had this discussion on, you know, oh, you know, life has life is quite demanding. There is so much even even young young kids these days, okay, there is a lot of expectation. They are going through their own stress. Um, my, my son has just turned 13. So they're going through their own struggles of, you know, fitting in, um, of keeping up with the academic and, and all that. So, but then um, I was just 
you know, having this conversation with uh, my son also, where I was saying that at the end of the day, irrespective of the challenges, and life is like that. You cannot expect life to be a bed of roses. When you face challenges, it's really about looking at it, changing your perspective, reframing it, and telling yourself that I'm going to have fun no matter what. Because yeah. life, you know, that spark and that fun needs to be part of life. Yeah, 100%. And I feel like if you're going through life and you're constantly feeling stressed or anxious or constantly worried about something, it really takes a toll on you mentally and physically and it really stops you from being able to do all the things that you want to do yeah. with life and life shouldn't always be stressful I mean obviously when you've got a career there's stress involved with that but you should also be able to have fun and laugh and have a good time as well so I guess that balance there is also a part of like your life's purpose it's not always how can I you know have the most successful career that's my life purpose it's so much more than that as well Yes, yes, totally, totally. Yeah. yeah, and your key talks include a topic um, called living a fulfilling and productive life. Um, can you elaborate on strategies you advocate for achieving fulfillment? Mm, absolutely. So let me just share a bit of a context on why I speak about this topic, right? Yeah. So, um, and it is quite related to my uh, my own journey, um, as I shared before, right? Like wherein, uh, if I if I look at productivity, it was a time when my career was going extremely well. Uh, you know that it was a time when things were going very well professionally. I was very very productive, right? Like to yeah. a, a PhD at twenty six, award, and then you know pharma company very early on. All that was going well, but. My biological productivity, I mean, I, I, you know, I say in a joking way, uh, biological productivity, actually the lack of it started affecting everything else in my life. And yeah, yeah so it slowed down, my, it slowed down my career path, right? But then I had to slow down in my career in order to achieve something in my personal life. So that actually made me recognize something about productivity. That is when we talk about productivity, most of the times it's, it's in terms of work. Like, you know, productivity tools, productivity hacks, do this, do that. And then, but when I look at life as a whole, sometimes these hacks don't work. Like how many of us actually want to be a, in being the 5 a.m. club, get up in the morning, put on those shoes and, you know, jog. But yeah. yeah, but how many of us are able to do that? And it's not because we are not motivated or inspired all the time. Like if I just look back at a time when I had my children, my babies, Five o'clock is the time that I would go to sleep, right? <laughs> because I'm up all night with them. So yeah. I recognize that productivity and all of that is something very personal. Like it really depends on your life situation and your life phase. Yeah. So when and every time I try to define it as, oh, I need to get, you know, so many things done, like a checklist of things done. Sometimes it's impossible. Like, for example, yesterday I had a neck, neck sprain. And that's it. Every plan that I had went for a toss. I had to rest. Yeah. Yeah. So then how do you actually um, account for it? Right. So we can't be beating ourselves up for not getting things done because you're unwell. Um, so this is where I, I bring in this aspect of fulfillment. You know, how to how to actually live a fulfilled life and how fulfillment can be a measure of productivity. So how that is, it, it is like this. Uh, it's not just about work. Yeah, you know, like just just sit to reflect about what are your important priorities in your, okay, say work, in your personal life, in your social life, and in your spiritual life. So by spiritual, what I mean is it's not about spirits. It's really about getting to know yourself. It yeah. could be a journey through like meditation. It could be like people who love nature walks. It could be people who love hobbies, things like that. That is what I call broadly a spiritual Social is broadly what I call um, as interactions with friends. Like in my current phase of life, friends play a very, very big role. So I do have slots and time for them uh, to spend time with them. Personal is like your family, all of those things. And work is work, right? But work, there is also two kinds. Work, a job that pays you and work that fulfills you. Like yeah. for example, for me, uh, speaking coaching, all of that is like work that really fulfills me as an individual. So it does have a place in my life over and above my actual job or my title. Yeah. 
So it's about identifying that one thing that is most important for you to 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 have fulfillment in one area, in, in each of these areas. And just doing that. Like a simple thing I would say is for me in my personal life, like I was talking about mom's guilt, right? So yeah. it is impossible for me to um, cater to all of my kids' needs together with with my job. Yeah. Right. So I can. But so I now what I do is I've identified certain things that are non-negotiables for me. That is, if my children come, if they need me to talk to me, then I'm there for them. Or um, yeah. So it's not like okay, day to day I will cook for them, I'll feed them, all of that I have just let go. Yeah. I've been able to delegate some of those tasks, right? So that I can give my actual time what is most needed in having conversations with my kids and having walks with my kids and have so those that has I have prioritized that yeah and it's not a big ask it's a small ask so it's about identifying those small and important things that actually fulfill you right so when you define it as fulfillment it's it's like you will be able to go to bed in a and get a good night's sleep but if there are like if you go with a checklist of things then I feel every time there's an undone task you just like lose your restfulness. Yeah, definitely. And how do you ensure that your core values also align with your life's purpose? Because obviously you can have this purpose to change the world and make it a better place, but also you've got your own personal values. So how do you make sure you're not compromising on them in order to achieve, you know, what you feel is your purpose? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it has to be aligned. Core values, like I feel that is the most important thing, you know, um, every time. So that is what determines like what I choose to do and what I uh, choose not to do, my core yeah. values. So I have had um, an understanding of my core values. And I think even when I chose my life partner long, long ago, it was based on under, uh, on some values such as re- respect. Like respect is very important for me. Yeah. Trust is a very, very important core value. Integrity is an extremely important core value. So once you know your core, the most important thing I feel is gaining awareness on what are your core values, right? So every time something comes in your space that is not aligned with the core values, it's the ability to like recognize and then no, that's not for me. Yeah. And that's so interesting because it it's easier said than done because sometimes you might really want something or like the idea of something, whether that be a career, an opportunity, whatever it is, but it doesn't align with, you know, for example, values of respect and, um, you know, all of that. And it's hard to say no to some things when you're like, wow, I really want that, but it, it doesn't treat me well, or it doesn't align with what I want. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, and even with my children, you know, I, I tell them um, to identify their core values, which will help them define who their friends are. Yeah. And which is very important. I feel it at such a young age, you know, where they can get easily influenced because there's so much of peer pressure around. Yeah. So again, I have conversations with my kids too, wherein I ask them what are, you know, some core values, what are some things that you're not willing to let go. Right. And it's, I think it really helps them anchor back to that and make decisions for themselves yeah. as well. Yeah. Definitely. And my mom has always been a big advocate for make sure your friends align with your values and who you are as a person. And, you know, she always says, um, take the good and leave the bad behind. That's exactly. like a catchphrase. Um, and it's really helped me, especially with friendships. I feel like when you're in your like younger stages of life. You want to be friends with everyone. If someone's nice to you, you're like, yeah, they're my friend. But yeah. then as you get older, you start to recognize the values that are very important to you. And it becomes easier to let go of the things that are not meant for you once you see how damaging or how bad they are for you when they exactly. don't contribute towards your life's purpose or your core values. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like and- I like what your mom said, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because it's it's impossible to sometimes avoid people. Uh, you know, you can't uh, that might also look look like. A, but if you know what your core values are, you can still be in a crowd, you know, of full of mixed kinds of people. 
but absorb only the good and not fall into the bad you know that's yeah. a very good advice actually Ah, oh, well, thank you. My mum is full of all that advice and she constantly tells me that. She's like, Joanna, take the good and leave the bad behind. Always yeah. put yourself first. She's full of those kinds of things, which is great. Um, but moving on a bit, uh, I know balance is key in all of this as well. So how do you balance productivity and fulfillment? especially for people, you know, who want to be in demanding fields like STEM, but also, you know, want to manage a personal life and they've got personal ambitions as well, whether that be a family, relationships or whatever. Yeah. So this is something uh, which it is a constant discussion that, you know, I have with, uh, with people and especially women of my age who have been there, done it all in the sense like they've had career success and they have had families so one of the things, you know, it's about how we define balance, actually. And like I said, what are you seeking? Uh, what What is your definition of work-life balance or what is that? That is very important. So, for example, for some people, like some of my friends, uh, stopping work at a fixed time and going home is very important. It doesn't matter what they do after that. Uh, but that that stopping work at the time, like setting that boundary and going is very important. Uh, for some people, it is really being able to have some flexibility in managing, you know, work while taking care of their personal matters, like flexibility, right? And so in STEM fields too, um, it is, it's not very different in terms of what see people are seeking. And it also depends on the different phases and stages of your life, like how you define it, right? So end of the day, I feel that if you are able to again identify in that particular phase of life or in this particular phase of life, what is what is some what are some things that I need to do in order to be fulfilled? Right. So, uh, for example, and also and also being very realistic about your expectations, like say, for example, if your goal is OK, like, for example, when I took up my PhD, it is a major commitment in life. So. The reality is that PhD will take up most of my time and I have very little time for family and all that. So sometimes when you accept reality as it is, it is easier to uh, manage that expectation, right? And manage yeah. expectation and redefine what work life means to you in that point. And when I, when I was focused on having my baby, like, you know, I was going through the infertility treatments, I left everything. My entire focus was, you know, on, on, on becoming a mom, becoming a mother. And it was like a dedicated effort. I can, you know, like I even cut off from every, like everybody, everything so that I could just focus on, take care of myself and be ready to become a mother. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I would say it's a, it's a balance is really how we define it and how we can uniquely find ways to say that, okay, in this phase, this is the reality. These are my expectations and okay, are my expectations really being very realistic at the moment? And what is one small thing I can do to be fulfilled in this particular area? I think that's a way it, it will keep you very peaceful and restful as well. Yeah, definitely. And I like this idea of accepting reality as well. I feel like if you're confused about what to do, you don't have to look too far other than to what's happening right in front of you. You don't have to make up scenarios or anything like that. You just look at what's going on in your life and that's your reality. And if you accept it, it makes it easier to know, okay, how do I balance the things that are in front of me and actually happening? So yeah. I think that's a really great point. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Yeah. My pleasure. Um, I'd love to turn to our practices and habits now, which we're just going to expand upon what we've been talking about through practical strategies. So is there a practice that you recommend to help cultivate resilience? So, yeah, I mean, there are various things which one can do to practice resilience. And that is one of the things is, I think, naturally for me, one of the biggest um, biggest aspects has been just pure optimism, right? I mean, like I said, accepting what happens uh, and not being in denial is very important. That is, um, that is, it's important to honor your emotions. You know, when you're feeling sad, you're feeling sad. You've lost a job. You know, you're facing a loss. Like I, I uh, you know, when I lost my grandfather, it took me a while to 
recently. I mean, it took me a while to overcome that law. So uh, it is important to honor our emotions. So resilience doesn't mean that you're just, you know, shutting, uh, you know, like uh, shoving all your emotions under the carpet. No, I think resilience really is really about acknowledging your emotions, um, being with it, letting it there, letting it be there, but at the same time, not letting it consume you. Right. Yeah. And, um, and this reflecting on it, you know, reflecting on certain situation uh, on the situation that has happened, asking questions, uh, exploring, being curious about it, and like giving yourself the the thing, you know, or looking even back uh, at past events in your life wherein you have, um, you know, faced some obstacles, some challenges, but you overcome it. So we can draw inspiration and hope from our own experiences and reframe our situations and keep telling ourselves that it, this is a transient phase. Yeah. Yeah, so knowing that every phase in life is actually a transient phase, this is, nothing is permanent. Yeah. And yeah. feeling, opt yeah, so that is, I think, in a way of cultivating optimism and um, resilience and cultivating resilience from our own experiences. So Lakshmi, in the beginning of this um, conversation, you mentioned that we're living in a Barney world at the moment and you mentioned ideas like ang anxiousness and the world is brittle and those have negative connotations to them. So can you explain this concept of the Barney world a bit more and strategies that we might be able to use to overcome, you know, the challenges that come along with this? Yeah. Thanks for, um, you know, this question, right? Because I have done some uh, deep reflections on how we can particularly navigate through this Bani world, which is like Bani is Bani stands for brittle, anxious, non-linear and incomprehensible. So it is like it is a very, very um, apt definition of the world wherein we, we can no longer have illusions of, you know, like stability and constancy. Right. Because you see, you hear of all these like people losing jobs, redundancy and all of those things, which is causing a lot of anxiety in today's world. And it is also very um, hard to actually comprehend and predict things the way we, we, way we could in the past. So the way I suggest to overcome this is by reframing the Bani to thinking like, say, for example, brittle to buoyant. So buoyancy is your ability to float, right? So I I just feel that sometimes, you know, when things are not really going very well, even the ability to just stay afloat, forget like moving to your, towards your goal or towards a particular direction. And I can say this from an experience I had when back in Kerala, when we were visiting my um, hometown in Kerala in uh, 2018, our town was hit by floods. And this was totally unexpected, very unprecedented. The word unprecedented for the first time I used, you know, when, when this happened to our hometown. And I can just tell you that when it happened, I was there with our family, our children, my parents, my grandparents. And we actually had to literally move from the ground floor to the second floor, second floor, you know, in order to, um, yeah, in order to stay away from the floods. And in that situation, um, the whole time we were thinking about how we can actually escape this, right? And then in that moment, we were willing to leave everything, all our passports, our ID cards, our money, our diamonds and everything just to evacuate the place. So all of a sudden, what was evident to me through my own experience is that when we face adversities in life, our instinct is to just survive, right? Yeah. It is not to like keep hold on to everything. At that time, fame, wealth, all of that thing, all of those things don't matter anymore. Your instinct is to just survive. So I feel that buoyancy and just as in the floods, we just want to, you know, we were actually rescued through those tires, you know, like those that, that served as temporary boats. Yeah. So, yeah. And I just feel the ability to just float is enough. So instead of seeing things as brittle, we can reframe it as buoyant. And again, ang anxious, instead of being very anxious, about what's going to happen. Am I going to lose my job? What will I do if I lose my business or all of those things? Instead of that, the point we discussed earlier about acceptance. Yeah. Anxious to accept, accept the reality. So that will give us the confidence and the courage to navigate through these uncertain uh, situations, right? Yeah. 
yeah and non linear of course things are not so predictable anymore so i would say in such a time just expand your network so n you know you can like expand your network use platforms like linkedin etc to expand your network and that will open up new opportunities mm-hmm. and last but not the least in con- in incomprehensible wherein you when you can't comprehend what is happening around the best thing i have learned to do is just shift your focus inward that is when externally you cannot comprehend anything you get answers from your inner wisdom so this is where in you just let go of all the chatter all the noise everything that is outside and just focus on you know yourself in the sense that pray for guidance from within and it brings in a lot of peace that uh, you know from from the from the inside of you so this is how i would say and it's it's a great uh, way to actually demonstrate resilience in a in the world that is you know which is highly disruptive and dynamic today yeah and thank you so much for sharing that and i'd love to ask where this concept of bani came from so bani is actually um, a very well researched topic i mean it's a concept it's i can't remember the name of the person who first came with it but it's in the cor- in the corporate world it is like very well defined actually so you yeah you can search for bani and you can see how it is um yeah being proposed off hand i can't remember the name of the person yeah yeah that's okay thank you i'll definitely look into that because i haven't heard of it before but it sounds very interesting and very accurate based on what i've observed about the world around me as well so thank you so much for those insights um absolutely I'd, yeah i'd love to end with our last section now which is our open mic so here it's just a chance for you to talk about anything that you're passionate about so yeah it's all yeah. yours yeah i am actually quite passionate these days about um making coaching leadership development programs etc accessible to the scientific community and yeah. the reason why i say this is because i've been in science for a very long time in different roles in uh, academic research industry research science communication program management and what i feel is that uh, as compared to the corporate world uh, there is very little um avenues available for scientists in, for their personal development so this is extremely important because through my own journey i feel that had i had a coach or you know if i had some knowledge about how to better manage my career choices and life situations i would have probably also saved a lot of time of course i have no regrets about how my life has turned because i mean it's it's beautiful the way it has turned out but i do feel that um developing certain skills beyond technical skills like just the scientific knowledge um skills such as even ex- skills such as communication skills networking skills presentation skills and plus all of these life skills such as resilience right overcoming imposter syndrome all of that actually help people advance much better and science community especially i feel can benefit because you know it is a community that contributes so much to innovation and major any major life uh, sorry world problems can be solved through science right as we learned through the vaccinations during the pandemic right that which which literally helped us move through the pandemic and emerge out of it so yeah. i feel that just supporting the scientific community more through these um, you know things would be like much would be really really helpful and with my background in science and experience as a coach and a speaker i would really love to uh, launch more programs to support the scientific community yeah. yeah so people in scientific community i mean science biotech healthcare pharma yeah that sounds really amazing and i think it's so important for people to expand upon their passions in a way that also helps others because no matter what you're interested in no matter how niche or how big it is there's always someone else out there in the world that wants to do the same thing as you do and if you create opportunities for them to feel connected to someone who's like you as well it creates a big community of people and i guess it can sort of reduce those feelings of loneliness you know yes. and it makes a brutal world i guess feel more stronger and connected yeah absolutely absolutely amazing well thank you so much lakshmi for coming on the show today and sharing your journey with us and how you've overcome adversities of your own and found your life purpose and you know you showed us how it's a continuous journey you don't just find your life purpose and then it ends and then that's it you don't 
do anything else after that. It's a continuous yeah. process. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It is a, that is the most important thing. You know, it is, it is an evolving process. It's a journey. It is not something that, you know, you say, oh, I've got it. And it's, yeah. I, I no longer require it. Because each challenge we face is different. But each time we can, we can revisit our past experiences and gain strengths and insights and courage from it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I've learned so much as well talking to you and seeing how you've overcome, you know, challenges in your life. And I think it's really great to be able to connect to someone in that way and also just have little nuggets of advice to use as well. Um, so thank you so much for that. And for our listeners who want to find out a bit more about you, your work, maybe your work as, you know, being a speaker, where can they go? Yeah. Uh, so I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So if they search for Dr. Lakshmi Ramachandran on LinkedIn, that is one area. I hope we can send out the link as well. The other yeah. is my website because uh, my web website is Dr. Lakshmi Speaks. Yeah, so that is another place where they can find me. Beautiful. Well, we've also included Lakshmi's details down in the description below if you did miss that. But to everyone listening, thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you all next time. Thank you so much. You have been listening to Bouncing Back, the personal resilience science insights podcast produced by the Life Management Science Labs. Listen to episodes from LMSL's 10 Life Management Perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or other podcasting apps on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people find it and us grow to bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, pr.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Joanna. Thanks for tuning in.